what was what was your relationship like with uh, Joan Crawford? Oh, utterly professional and pleasant. Yeah. Yes, really. Did, did did you like one another uh, outside of working together? Well, we 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 were very different kinds of women. Yeah. Different kinds yeah. of actresses, and personally, would never be great great friends, but professionally. As a matter of fact, one day Joan said, every, the, when the press came on, hoping, hoping daggers were flying, that we should put on the wall, we're getting along very well, sorry to disappoint you. <laughs> yes, we did. So, this is the tricky one. Not only because Betty Davis's performance in Whatever Happened to Baby Jane is clearly the most iconic in this lineup which makes it always a bit more difficult as it's sometimes hard for me to separate reputation from opinion in my reviews. But also because, by now, the legends surrounding the making of Baby Jane have more or less become almost more dominant than the film itself and it seems that everything that can be said has been said already. If you enjoy a, let's be honest, mostly fictionalized account of the relationship between Betty and Joan, you can watch an entire miniseries about it. And if you want an honest and calm presentation about their careers and how they interacted with each other, you can watch a very insightful video by Be Kind Rewind that I link below. So yes, everything has been said and I don't intend to repeat all of it. I think what I want to do instead is to provide a bit of background to certain questions that I have often wondered about myself. I enjoy feud like every other actress lover, but the way so many rumors and exaggerations are presented as facts has always bothered me, as it distorts so much about what actually happened, as well as the Oscar win of Anne Bancroft. Again, Be Kind Rewind did a great job analyzing much of this already, so no need for me to do it here, or to again explain the dynamics of the so-called feud, its roots and true dimensions. What I'd just like to do instead is take a closer look only at the making and the reception of whatever happened to Baby Jane, especially in comparison to what is shown on Feud, and answer questions like how Betty and Joan, because you cannot talk about Betty in 1962 without also talking about Joan, came up with whatever happened to Baby Jane in the first place, what the situation of their careers and their lives was like when they decided to work together, how the shooting of the movie was really like, and if Betty was truly considered the standout between the two of them. So let's dive right in and start with the first question. How did the paths of Joan and Betty cross for whatever happened to Baby Jane in the first place? I guess it all starts here, in a dressing room at the Royal Theatre in New York. That's actually one of the things I always wanted to know if it really happened, but yes, from all accounts, Joan did visit Betty backstage while she was appearing on Broadway with the offer for whatever happened to Baby Jane. As Betty remembered, I was rather surprised to see her. She came backstage after a matinee and told me about a book which had parts for both of us in it. Okay, so far so good. But if we start here, we miss the bigger picture. The situation doesn't tell us why Joan offered the project to Betty in the first place if she, as Feud wants us to believe, truly hated her so much. And why did Betty accept it if, as Few tells us, she hated Joan so much? Why would both of them be interested in material that was essentially considered a B-movie at the time? And why would Betty leave a prestigious Broadway production for it? After all, she was not appearing in just any play, but in The Night of the Iguana by Tennessee Williams, because we just cannot escape him this year. As I had mentioned in my previous videos, working with him was usually a big honor for actors, and Betty herself had actually tried to get a part in the movie version of Suddenly Last Summer, which would ultimately be played by Catherine Hepburn, the same actress Williams had in mind when he wrote the female lead in The Night of the Iguana. So this does seem like a dream come true for Betty, especially since these kinds of prestigious projects did not happen every day for her anymore. But in this case, Feud is actually right, showing Betty as extremely unsatisfied with The Night of the Iguana. And she was apparently not shy to let everyone know about it. And while working on the play, the worst rumors about Betty's onset difficulties seem to have come true. During the rehearsal period, she would quit various times due to illness, only to return dramatically when her demands had been met, sounds familiar, refused to listen to any direction on her performance, even demanding that director Frank Cassero be fired, and constantly clashed so viciously with her co-stars that actor Patrick O'Neill would even physically attack her at one point. Now we know that Betty was always very open in being demanding on set and expecting nothing less than 100% from everyone else, and she could be difficult if she did not get that. 
but being unreasonably difficult, as it seems to be the case during the Night of the Iguana, is different. And to explain her problems with the play, but also her entire life, and why it made her involvement with Baby Jane much more likely, we again need to get back a little more. Following her comeback with All About Eve, Betty Davis would have another hit with and receive another Oscar nomination for The Star, which I covered in my 1952 series, but after that she entered what she later called her 10 black years, a time of both professional and private disappointments. You know, you said 10 years there was nothing. Oh yes, industry. absolutely. Well, I mean, how do you feel about that? Because I think the most hellish well, thing just... about being an actor is when you're out of work. Well, I wasn't out of work. Oh. And there was nothing in the, in the no picture I made made money. But you, oh, oh I, I see I what make you mean. one every year. I see. But I became, you see, uh, on the list of non-money makers. After she had married her All About Eve co-star Gary Merrill, Betty Davis initially felt that it was now time for her to focus on her private life, to make her marriage a success and take care of her children. She therefore stopped acting completely for the next few years, but soon found out that she was not made for this kind of domestic life and that acting was a too important part of her life to give it up. But beyond this, she also had a more tragic reason to return to work. She and her husband discovered that their adopted daughter Margaret suffered from brain damage and the bills for her medical treatment pressured Betty to keep working in the years to come. Horrible. It was horrible. When a, a brain injured child gets much, much older, it, it's different, fortunately. It, it, it levels off a bit, but it was terrible. My mother said, send her back. Betty Davis therefore slowly returned to acting in 1955 with The Virgin Queen. However, the work she did in the following years, including a small supporting role as Catherine the Great in John Paul Jones and various television dramas, satisfied neither herself, nor her audience, nor the critics, and it seemed that the career of Betty Davis had truly reached its end. Beyond these professional setbacks, her marriage to Gary Merrill also slowly fell apart, Betty remembering, Security was always bad medicine for Gary. Once he had something, I'm afraid he didn't want it anymore. It then became a responsibility he resented. It tied him down. By the end of the decade, both Betty and Gary knew that their marriage was over for good. However, they had a contractual obligation to work together in a national tour of the world of Carl Sandburg. We wanted terribly to cancel our contract, but of course this was impossible. We'd meet in the morning, rehearse all day, then go our separate ways. We communicated very seldom, except on stage. We toured in a chauffeur-driven car, usually 200 to 300 miles a day. The most difficult moments were those long drives each day, with very little to talk about. The show was a big success, but would only add to the tension between husband and wife, and Betty Davis finally handed Gary Merrill the divorce papers while they were on tour in 1960 which would also remove his right to appear with her and he was ultimately replaced by another actor. For Betty, her fourth failed marriage again confirmed that for her, work came above everything else. You really said, Betty, it has been my experience that one cannot in any shape or form depend on human relations for any lasting reward. It is only work that truly satisfies. Yes, that stands by you. It isn't that many people don't... Uh, add a great deal to your life. But I'm talking about as a permanent thing. That's the least disappointing relationship you can have. During this time of personal sorrow, there finally seemed to be a professional bright spot when Betty Davis received a visit from Tennessee Williams, who offered her a role in his new play The Night of the Iguana. But while she was looking forward to appearing in a serious production on Broadway for the first time in almost three decades, her life received another crushing blow. Her beloved mother, with whom she always had a very close relationship, died in July 1961. These were the circumstances when Betty Davis began to work on the Night of the Iguana. She was broken from both another failed marriage and the death of her mother and also extremely dissatisfied by her career in the last decade. It's easy to imagine that working with Tennessee Williams might have appeared to be an ideal distraction 
and a great way to restart her career and reclaim her position as one of America's major dramatic actresses. But instead of being a return to former glory, it turned into another disappointment. First of all, as I have mentioned in my Geraldine Page video, Tennessee Williams always had very clear ideas about what actors he wanted to cast in his plays. And he also had very specific ideas about Betty Davis. Namely, that she was completely wrong. But by the time of the Night of the Iguana, the pressure to produce hit after hit had almost become unbearable for Williams, also increasing his alcoholism, and he was willing to cast Betty purely as a box office draw. Sure, she had not been in a hit for a long time, but she was still Betty Davis, and her return to Broadway was sure to attract a big audience. However, Williams' willingness to compromise only went so far, and Betty was not offered the female lead he had initially written for Catherine Hepburn, which was ultimately cast with Margaret Layton, the actress William had wanted for Sweet Bird of Youth, but instead she was given the supporting role of Maxine. As you can imagine, a supporting role is not what an actress like Betty Davis dreams about. She publicly stated that she'd rather play a small role in a Tennessee Williams play than the lead in something else, but she only signed for The Night of the Iguana based on the understanding that her part would be further developed during rehearsals, which ultimately did not happen. The play was therefore not a revival of her career, but instead only confirmed Betty's feelings of constantly going downhill. Finally, she would also begin to feel more and more out of place in the world of New York theater and among her co-stars, all method actors, an approach to acting she personally detested, and she introduced herself to co-star Margaret Layton with the words, we don't have to be friends, do we, to work together. So ultimately, yes, these scenes from Feud are true. Betty played second fiddle in The Night of the Iguana, and she knew it. She brought in an audience, no doubt about that, making the play the hoped-for financial hit, but being only a box office draw was not satisfying for Betty. She loathed sitting around backstage waiting for one of her appearances, and she also knew that she was being overshadowed by Margaret Layton, who also won a Tony as Best Actress in a Play, while her own reviews were mostly mixed. It became clear that the Night of the Iguana did not put Betty Davis back at the top, and she would soon say, anytime you see a Hollywood actor on the Broadway stage, it's because they have nothing else to do. So these were the circumstances of Betty's life in 1962. She still mourned the loss of her mother, suffered from the failure of a marriage to Gary Merrill, and was extremely unhappy about her professional life as she found herself less and less relevant, reduced to supporting roles, working with a new generation of actors she did not understand. Which all explains why she was very open when a movie offer came from the most unlikely direction. Okay, I am well aware that this video is about Betty, but as I said, it's impossible to talk about Baby Jane without also talking about Joan. And if we want to get into the dynamics of the making of the movie and the aftermath at the Oscars, we also need to talk about what happened that would actually lead Joan into Betty's dressing room with an offer she couldn't refuse. Some rumors say that following sudden fear, which had brought Joan her third and, as she would find out after Baby Jane, last Oscar nomination, Joan apparently turned down the role of Karen in From Here to Eternity due to its limited size. And I mean, she has a point, and it gave us Deborah Carr in the movie, who is obviously amazing. But Joan still did quite well in this decade overall, with movies that maybe did not make an immediate critical impact, but are definitely their own kinds of classics by now, like Johnny Guitar and Autumn Leaves. Plus, Joan's movies also made money, so she was overall definitely more successful during this decade than Betty Davis. But Joan, like Betty, would also begin to focus more strongly on her private life soon. In 1955, she met Alfred Steele, CEO of Pepsi-Cola, and got married to him the same year, which would also mean accompanying him on his various business trips and effectively ending her work in movies. Which, however, was fine for her at this moment. For years, I'd been reluctant to leave Hollywood for one minute. They might forget me, I might miss a good script, a Mildred Pierce might come along, and I'd not be there. Now I was eager to travel. Plus, a marriage to Steele would also bring Joan the always desired financial stability. And so she overcame her lifelong fear of flying to become the face of Pepsi across the globe. As she remembered, 200,000 miles, 
Africa or Mexico, Beirut or Joplin, Missouri, Switzerland, the Belgian Congo, people were waiting to say hello. This was part of our schedule wherever we went. Press conferences the first thing in the morning. Alfred would speak to the financial editors and news reporters, I would speak to women editors and movie critics. So it seems that Joan was perfectly happy to spend her days from now on with her husband at her side, traveling on behalf of Pepsi and enjoying a secure life. But everything changed when Steele died from a sudden heart attack in April 1959. This story also interested me a bit more, because I never quite understood why Joan was apparently in such deep financial trouble during the time of whatever happened to baby Jane if she was the widow of Pepsi's CEO. But yes, this point is true. Steele and Joan had led a very luxurious life that often exceeded his income. For example, renovating their New York apartment with money that the company only loaned to them. On top of that, Steele also had to pay alimony and child support after two previous marriages and in general was spending more money than he made. And after his death, left Joan with a lot of debt. Many newspapers reporting around this time that she was broke. She obviously denied any rumors in this direction, but for a woman who feared poverty more than anything else, one thing was clear. She had to go back to work. Like Betty, Joan however found it more and more difficult to get the work she was used to. The times of women's pictures were over and the offered scripts got worse and worse. Like Betty, Joan accepted a supporting role in The Best of Everything, but then focused primarily on television. The Best of Everything also had made it very clear to her that she had lost her status as a movie queen as her younger co-stars had far more influence over the director and the movie set. Joan, always a fighter and never afraid to enter a new chapter in her career if the circumstances demanded it, knew that if she wanted things to change, she had to do what she had always done. Take things into her own hand. She had left the security of MGM when she felt the material was not up to her talents and waited for two years until Warner Brothers and Mildred Pierce brought her back to the top. And when things at Warner slowed down at the beginning of the 50s, she again dropped her contract and looked for better scripts herself, eventually reading a book called Sudden Fear, which she successfully pursued as a star vehicle for herself. So it was very intriguing for me to find out if things really worked out like Feud showed them, with Joan again reading book after book to find the right project for herself. Well, sources here don't give a definite answer. While some say that Joan found Baby Jane and she approached director Bob Aldrich with it, others state that it was actually the opposite and that Aldrich was sent the book by his secretary and then passed it on to Joan. Well, no matter who read it first, the reason why they both immediately thought of each other was that Joan had already talked to Bob Aldrich about wanting to do a movie with Betty while they were working together on Autumn Leaves. It was a wish that went back even further, as Joan had thought about having Betty as a co-star on Johnny Guitar and also wanted to do a movie with her based on the novel Ethan Frome, saying, I thought it would be good chemistry, something there isn't much of in movies anymore. I would think it was the most uh, rewarding experience in the world. As a matter of fact, I put the deal together. Did you really? Oh. I'd wanted to work with her since uh, we were at Warner Brothers together. And uh, I wanted to do Ethan Frome with her. I thought we would be great in mm -hmm. it with uh, Raymond Massey. Oh. Well, you were great in whatever happened to Baby Jane. Well, it was a good <laughs> box office chemistry. While a suitable project never came along so far, it seemed that whatever happened to Baby Jane was exactly what Aldrich and Joan had in mind when they discussed the opportunity of a Crawford Davis vehicle. A movie with two equal female roles. Joan's desire to work with Betty already in the early 50s also indicates that it's very unlikely a serious feud was actually going on. Again, I'm not going to retail the whole story here. There were the rumors about Betty Davis having a thing for French Tone while he was with Joan, and the whole backstory of the star as a movie portraying Joan as a washed up has been, but in 1961, likely enough years had passed, especially considering that they barely had any real contact professionally or privately, and each of them was facing far bigger worries and problems in their lives. And even though we so often tend to focus on Betty Davis in the story here, I have to say, kudos to Joan who realized that the two of them working together would have an undeniable publicity effect. The feud was certainly exaggerated, 
but it was in people's heads, so why not benefit from it? Beyond this, a project like this had the power to give them back what both had lost. A movie only focused on their characters, with no male or younger female co-stars to steal the attention. As just mentioned, Joan was always very realistic about her career and at this point she knew that she alone might not have the necessary star power anymore to produce a hit. But a co-star of equal standing might change things. Especially since so few female top stars of the 30s and 40s had actually worked together. So whoever Joan would think of might certainly create relevant interest, but it's clear that only one name would truly cause a sensation. The fact that Joan was in general also more successful in the last 10 years probably also gave her the necessary confidence to approach Betty, knowing that basically she needed her more. And this brings us back to that dressing room. The stories of Betty and Joan up to this moment make it clear why this was such an important decision for both of them and why Betty reacted so positively to this offer. Baby Jane would mean a lot of things she didn't have anymore. A leading role in a Hollywood production, with an experienced director and an established co-star, who was also thankfully no method actor, but instead would bring her as far back to the feelings of her heydays as possible. And of course, on top of that, it would give her an alternative to the Night of the Iguana. And considering that, as mentioned already, their feud at this moment was very likely completely blown out of proportion, working together might not be the most pleasant experience for either of them, but still something that, considering the possible results, both were easily willing to do. And so Betty left her Broadway show after 128 performances in typical Betty Davis style, telling the other cast members after her final show, I'm sorry I had to irritate you for so long with my professionalism. You obviously like doing it your way much better. Well, now you can. Her role would then be taken over by Shelley Winters. Now, before we get into the shooting of Whatever Happened to Baby Jane, maybe asking how, I first was also interested in why. As I had said in the beginning, why was Betty willing to get involved with material that was a far cry from the prestigious role she had done during her peak? And of course, why did it appeal so much to Joan as well that she personally picked it out as the ideal project for them? I did actually not find any personal statements about this by either of them that go beyond it was a great role or it was a great script, so I can basically only tell you my own thoughts here. And yes, whatever happened to Baby Jane was certainly not the kind of project actresses from the golden age of Hollywood were expected to do. But again, Joan was not only an actress, but also a very ambitious businesswoman who always understood the trends of movie making and what audiences wanted to see. And one trend at the time was psychological thrillers. Psycho had shown that audiences clearly wanted these movies and, after all, the Academy also reacted positively. It was both the second biggest hit of the year and received a couple of major Oscar nominations. And Joan knew that Baby Jane would fall right into the same category at a time when these kinds of movies hadn't been around for too long and interest was still high. I have no idea how keen Joan actually was to enter the genre, but the times of a Mildred Pierce or a Now Voyager were clearly over. Baby Jane could at least combine these worlds, a women's picture for the 1960s. And both Betty and Joan knew how rare and difficult this was. As Betty later said, actresses had owned the industry for the previous 20 years and the men were entitled to their turn in the 50s and 60s. By then, the world's problems were wars, drugs, crime, political corruption. All the ills that involve men much more than women. And writers write about what is going on in the world. Given that trend, Baby Jane was truly a break for both Joan and me. Well, in those days it was a, a woman's industry. Yeah. As a matter of fact, George once said the only requirement for a leading man on the screen is to be sure that the back of his head <laughs> is cut well, because that's what you see the most of. The other thing that had always interested me, and that most sources, including Feud, never truly discuss, was how Joan and Betty decided on their roles. I mean, yes, both are essentially equal, but only one of them is the title character and only one of them is a true scene stealer. So why would Joan hand Jane to Betty? I, I'm offering you the title role. But I actually think it's not difficult to see that, at the time, this decision made a lot of sense for Joan. 
First of all, Blanche is the former movie star, allowing Joan to maintain her glamorous image and style. Second, playing a woman in a wheelchair does seem like the kind of physical transformative work that can attract Oscar attention. I worked in the wheelchair on the sets on all weekends because I had an inch on either side and with your hands there on the wheelchair, if they were too far out, I had very sore knuckles the two or three days I rehearsed. As a matter of fact, I took the wheelchair home with me at nights to learn how to get through doors. So it's easy to imagine that Joan essentially did not see the artistic potential of Jane at first and was ultimately caught by surprise that the real transformative work in the movie would happen somewhere else. When I did Jane, I could not Baby find Jane, yeah, I her. could not find her voice. I could not decide what kind of a woman this was. When I got into those clothes and that makeup, sometimes the clothes and the makeup suddenly give it to you. The Jane walk had nothing in the world to do with the way I walk or have ever walked in any other part. That walk uh, was a totally different walk. And third, always remember Joan's guiding principle when picking a part. I try to get a film that has audience identification. Regarding whatever happened to baby Jane, Joan most likely assumed that audiences would identify stronger with the victim of the story than her crazy torturer. I mean, Janet Lee got the Oscar nomination for Psycho and not Anthony Perkins. So for a rather careful actress and star, who was always keen to keep a certain persona for her fans, Jane was most likely an absolute no-go for Joan. While on the other hand, it's just as easy to see Betty being completely uninterested in Blanche. This kind of passive victim would certainly have bought her to death, as Betty was of course never afraid to shy away from an unlikable character or making herself unattractive for the sake of her role. And doing it again in Baby Jane would allow her to connect her work to her prime at Warner Brothers, increasing the effect of her performance and ultimately, Jane quite simply offered her endless opportunities to portray as many character-based decisions as possible. I mean, it's important to remember that she not only did whatever happened to baby Jane to do a movie again, she also did it because she saw Jane's potential, calling it one of the best scripts she had ever read. So the stage is set. Let's go to the making of whatever happened to baby Jane. First of all, most things you heard about the financing of the movie are true. Just because Joan and Betty wanted to do it, doesn't mean any of Hollywood's major studios were on board. Seven Art Pictures ultimately providing the money, but not much of it, while Warner Brothers agreed to distribute it. The Hollywood people would say, those two old broads, I wouldn't give you a dime. <laughs> As you can imagine, the news of Betty and Joan making a movie with each other created immediate headlines. This was a very big deal, two legendary performers from Hollywood's golden age working together for the first time. But of course, the focus in the media was not on the cultural significance of these casting news, but rather on what it would mean for the making of the movie. As always, it was impossible to imagine two women working together without them turning the set into their private boxing ring. Especially if these women already had very distinct reputations about their supposed difficulties behind the scenes. The question essentially was, could whatever happened to baby Jane be made without Betty and Joan creating a feud? of biblical proportions. Well, feud essentially says, no, it could not. Because everything you ever heard as a rumor, or you might have assumed based on some stories you read, is presented to us as cold hard facts. And this of course leads us to the big question. Whatever happened on the set of whatever happened to baby Jane? Again, I don't want to go into the details of Betty's and Joan's relationship too strongly here what they thought of each other during the prior decades, but only focus on the making of the movie. And yes, it's necessary to admit right away, there was certainly no love lost between them. But not because they apparently had hated each other for their entire careers, as we so often get to hear, but simply because they were very different persons with their own agendas. Betty, for example, seemed to have been mostly irritated by Joan's insistence on her public image, remembering she was always so damn proper. She sent thank you notes for thank you notes. She carried this saccharine politeness to such an exaggeration of courtesy that it was disgusting and irritating. 
I believed her attempts to butter me up were absolutely insincere. Joan in return would often resent Betty for the same reason she often resented other actresses in Hollywood, for essentially not playing the game and rejecting her ideas about what an actress should be. I don't hate her, even though the press want me to. I resent her. While we were doing Baby Jane together, I sent her flowers and then I sent her some chocolates. No response. She's phony, but I guess the public likes that. If you had done the scene with Betty Davis and Hush Hush Sweet Charlotte, would you have slapped her as savagely as did Olivia de Havilland? I didn't see the film. <laughs> so yes, Betty and Joan did not like each other and they had no plans to change that while shooting the movie. But there is a difference between considering someone annoying or hating them so much to physically hurt them. A difference that is lost on feud. I mean yes, all of this is entertaining. I have to admit that I have watched the show a couple of times by now. But once feud tricks its audiences into believing that all of this is fact, it becomes a problem and distorts not only Betty's and Joan's work in the movie, but also essentially their entire careers and legacies. Well, I never knew Joan Crawford personally. You did not? Oh, no, no. We just worked together. We worked together, of course, once on Jane, and then she started uh, on the film Charlotte, and it was taken ill. Uh-huh. And, uh, oh, no, I had never seen her after that. No, we did not. We were not uh, personal friends at all. Betty would sum up the shooting of Baby Jane with, Never were there two more opposite performers in a film. We were polite to each other. All the social amenities, good morning Joan and good morning Betty Crab. No actresses on earth are as different as we are, all the way down the line. Yet what we do works. And this is the key here. What they did worked. And because they were highly professional performers, they also knew it could only work if they worked together. No matter what Joan and Betty thought of each other, they wanted to make sure that Baby Jane got done and that it would be a success. And this is why, from all that can be read by essentially everyone involved, the set of the movie was extremely disciplined, with Betty and Joan behaving as professionally as humanly possible. And we have to remember that Joan and Betty did have very important reasons for this professionalism. First, financially. As I have just mentioned, securing the money for Baby Jane was quite a difficult task and it would only be shot on a very tight budget. To make this possible, both Joan and Betty accepted lower salaries. Betty got 60,000 and Joan 30,000. However, they both would also get part of the profits. Betty 10% and Joan 15%. And as we already established, both needed money. Joan to pay for her dead husband's debts and Betty to pay for her divorce, her children and the medical care for Margaret. And both knew that delaying production on the movie in any way, for example, by interrupting each other's takes or completely sabotaging it like this would only increase the costs and in return diminish their profits, which neither of them could afford. Both of them were far too dependent on the financial success of Baby Jane to risk it in any way. Betty was right when she later said, after Baby Jane opened, it made each of us rich for a while. It was wonderful it was successful because it was a woman's picture. The first one for a very long time that made any money. But it was important that Baby Jane would not only be a financial hit for Betty and Joan, but also an artistic one. This was supposed to be their comeback to leading roles. They wanted to get work. Baby Jane was almost like a Hollywood audition. They wanted to show that they still had it and what studios missed if they did not give them better projects. It's a hope that was not unjustified, not only because of their long standing in Hollywood, but also because while they were shooting whatever happened to Baby Jane on a limited budget and in a studio usually reserved for Warner Brothers B-Westerns, Rosalind Russell, one year older than Betty, information for Joe not available, was filming Gypsy right across the street. A high level project with a budget of $4 million and a 16 week shooting schedule. So Joan and Betty saw that things could be better and they would not let any personal feelings get in their way. Again, let's take a look at Feud. The show clearly wants to display Jones and Betty's desire for work and a better future as well, combining it with a message how hard it is for actresses of a certain age to find a place in Hollywood. This is certainly true, but at the same time you cannot overlook a certain feeling of, why would you want to work with them? 
By terrorizing each other on the set, they clearly make the life of everyone else working on Baby Jane a true nightmare too. Who would want to go through this? Who would want to hire them in the future? Who would ever accept this kind of behavior, risking a movie's success? Essentially, why should you give them a chance at all? When it comes to feud, you almost get the impression that Betty and Joan are two young starlets finding their way in show business when they made whatever happened to Baby Jane. Completely helpless about everything going on around them and manipulated at every step of the way, while themselves completely unable to control their worst impulses. But of course in reality, they were two of the biggest female stars Hollywood had ever seen, with more than 30 years of experience, both immensely disciplined and professional. Careers like theirs couldn't have happened if they would really be so easily manipulated or had truly behaved in any way like they did in Feud. Both of them knew that everyone was watching and what everyone expected. I mean, the same year Geraldine Page essentially fulfilled everyone's idea of how Hollywood divas behaved. And not fulfilling these expectations, not causing any trouble during the shooting, was of big importance for them to be considered for any possible future projects. I mean, let's listen to some of the involved parties. Joan Crawford People always ask me about my feud with Betty Davis. Well, it won't take long to tell about that. I didn't have a feud with her. I admired her as an actress. Betty Davis Feud is a Hollywood word. A widely overused Hollywood word. Everybody wanted a feud, but we wouldn't hear of it. There is no feud. A man and a woman, yes, but never two women. They'd be too clever for that. A newspaper article from 1962. Hollywood gossips predicted instant conflagration when the two Polish pros met on the set, which everyone was certain would soon become a battlefield. What happened instead was a kind of very examination of each other, an intense searching out of weaknesses and strengths. Not for purposes of destruction, but to find out how best they could mutually complement each other. Robert Aldrich I think it's proper to say that they really detested each other, but they behaved absolutely perfectly. No upstaging, not an abrasive word in public. Any comment about one or the other, they would reserve for the privacy of their own dressing room when the other one wasn't around. Again Betty Davis John Crawford and I got along famously, much to the huge disappointment of the Hollywood press. Anna Lee, who played the neighbor in Whatever Happened to Baby Jane. They didn't like each other. They did. They, they never showed it. They were one very well disciplined. And then we even have both of them. Of course you know, Joan, that everybody is trying to work up a feud between us. I know, dear. And isn't that ridiculous? We're much too professional for anything like that. Exactly. And who has time for such silliness? We'll be much too busy making the picture. And uh, we didn't have time. We're both too professional. And uh, Hollywood, of course, you can imagine, was just waiting for it. Yes. And they soon gave up and left us alone after about two weeks, you know. I but uh, we, just didn't, we just never would. Two women would be too smart. Again, I don't want to say that the entire shoot was one family picnic. For example, yes there were concerns that Joan was trying to look too glamorous for her part, or discussions how one actress should react to the other, and of course the expected arguments with director Robert Aldrich. I am not a bitch on the set. Number one, uh, there, is no, there is no way of making a film as a leading player and making everybody uncomfortable. But every argument taking place on the set of whatever happened to Baby Jane was always in a professional context. 
and nothing that we would not also see on any other movie sets, or would symbolize a legendary feud between two divas. And the depressing thing about feud creating the story of Betty and Joan constantly being at each other's throat is, that it overshadows all the positive things you could mention in this context. Feud presents them essentially as victims when it could have shown them as fighters. Instead of two actresses stepping into the traps that Hollywood might have set for them, you see two survivors, working according to their own agendas and defying anyone's expectations. You see two old pros who share the same work ethic and who are willing to do everything it takes to make the movie a success. Robert Aldrich would compliment both of them while making the movie, saying, I've never seen two stars work so hard and so willingly. They were totally professional. Why do we never see this hard work and professionalism? For example, instead of coming up with a scene of Joan being both too vain and too drunk to continue working, why not highlight how Victor Buono, according to Feud, firmly a member of Team Betty, praised Joan for her work attitude, especially citing one incident when he had to do the reaction shot to seeing Blanche tied up in her bedroom. Joan was already prepared to go home when Bruno arrived for the scene and immediately changed back into her costume and did a scene together with him to help him get a more authentic reaction. There were never two more opposed actresses working together in the world. Uh, just total, totally different people and systems. But I will say this for Miss Crawford, she is a professional, she is always on time, she knows her lines, and we made Jane, you know, in three weeks, Joan and I. Three weeks. Because that is all the money anybody would give for us. Shooting was actually a bit more than three weeks, 34 days to be exact, but still only two days over schedule. Something that would not have been possible without Betty and Joan truly giving it their all and being as cooperative as possible. No source confirms the incident of Betty kicking Joan in the head and about the other most famous rumor, Joan Crawford would later say, wait, and have Betty tell everyone I was as heavy as an elephant. Absolutely not. I may not have made it as easy for her to lift me out of the bed as I could have, at least at first, but when you're a pro, you get over any animosity you may feel and help your fellow player out. It simply didn't happen. I'm sure you must get very bored by the, the constant fiction that you and Bette Davis are positively daggers She'd drawn. She'd kill you if she heard you say Bette. She's a fascinating actress, Betty Davis. And the thing is, if any of these incidents, like Betty kicking Joan, constant insults and fights, would have happened in real life, we definitely would have heard about it. Because A, considering how keen the press was to extensively cover a clash of titans on Baby Jane, they surely would have eagerly picked up every story they heard from the set. But again, we come back to the fact that Betty and Joan are not unfamiliar with this. On the contrary, they were both very much aware that the days of old Hollywood, when every news story would be carefully constructed by your studio, were over. By now, gossip columnists wrote what they wanted. Betty and Joan had both experienced how stories about their marriages, their personal lives and their careers had become more vicious over the years and Joan especially knew that she couldn't control her image the same way she used to. In 1954, a newspaper article appeared with quotes by many of her former co-stars like Jack Palance, Mercedes McCambridge and other people in her professional and personal environment describing her as extremely difficult. For Joan, this hurt a lot because her entire image in Hollywood had always been built on how cooperative and professional she behaved on set. She knew that if she wanted to avoid similar reactions after Baby Jane, she would have to be a team player. And Betty, after all the stories around the night of the iguana, was equally determined to not give the header hoppers of the world another chance. They knew how the press operated and what it wanted but they would not give it to them. But no, no, we were too much pro uh, professionals for this. Uh, and and uh, out of spite, we didn't have a feud because everybody longed for it. So. <laughs> and then B, neither Betty nor Joan were shy to talk negatively about co-stars or other actresses that they considered unprofessional or not appreciative of the chances they were given. Joan had a much more real feud with Marilyn Monroe for almost her entire career she openly clashed with Mercedes McCambridge during Johnny Guitar and she also criticized Elizabeth Taylor in the 60s 
for what Joan considered exposing her private life. Did you enjoy working with Miss Davis? Ben yes, Davis? it was a fascinating experience. Had you ever worked together before? No, she's a great, great lady. Fantastic talent. It was just so exciting, I can't tell you, Johnny. Oh, that it was. I read in the papers, I suppose, I suppose they tried to do this, but some of the gossip columns were trying to create some kind of a feud between you and they said... The Even other. before we got to the coast, they were, were, were creating a feud. Was that just to try to be publicity oh, for, sure. for sure. the picture? Sure, we'll talk no, about it. No, not for the picture. Not for the no. picture, just for the columns. For Hollywood. There's no ah. excitement out there. Betty Davis, on the other hand, later used every chance she had to let everyone know about what she saw about a different co-star of hers. I'll raise my glass never to Miss Faye Dunaway. <laughs> never, never. Why was that? She is the most incredibly inconsiderate woman I have ever worked with. So who's one of the worst people you know in Hollywood? That I worked with? Or that you wouldn't want to work with again. If you don't, you don't have to comment one, on that. One million dollars, Faye Dunaway. <laughs> Everybody you can put into this chair will tell you exactly the same thing. <laughs> Self-centered and inconsiderate of her co-stars was something that Betty Davis could not forgive. And something she never accused Joan Crawford of. Even in later years, when Betty loved to tell and exaggerate stories like these about Joan... There Joan stood with Miss Bancroft's Oscar clutched to her bosom. It had, it had become hers. Yes, it had become hers. Or made comments like, I made whatever happened to Baby Jane with Joan. I played Baby Jane, she played whatever. Betty still would not say a negative word about Joan's work ethic during the time they worked together. Joan was a pro. I will always thank her for giving me the opportunity to play the part of Baby Jane Hudson. I know, isn't it incredible we're forever linked to we made one film? It's funny that remains. I'm sorry. I, I well, it was a good movie. It was a good movie. I I don't, as far as making the film with her, she was on time. She knew her lines. She basically was a pro. But we're very different kind of women, very different kind of actresses. Yes. And so, when all was said and done, there were no big stories about a feud on the set of Whatever Happened to Baby Jane. No scandals about Betty hurting Joan or Joan trying to sabotage the shooting. Instead, everybody ultimately realized that if there was any competition at all, it was purely professional. As one article put it, obviously the feud everyone expected was not in process. But it would be fair to say there's a duel between the old pros who are bringing every trick in the acting repertory to hold their own. The only battle between them was for acting honors. So to sum it up, neither Betty or Joan were on a mission to tear the other one down, but they clearly were aiming to be the critical standout at the end of the day. Which again, is probably true for every actor. And this finally brings us to the next chapter. How were the performances of Betty and Joan received? Was it really like this? It's like I wasn't even in the goddamn picture. Well, I guess the answer here is yes and no. I would say that many reviews of Whatever Happened to Baby Jane definitely talked about Joan's performance, simply because everyone agreed that the interplay between both actresses was what made the movie so intriguing, stating, they make a great time of opposites, each with her own unique brand of personality, or, the diverse roles have the precise limitations that give each actress full range of her ability. And reviewers did talk about Joan specifically as well, commenting that her performance as Blanche was a throwback to so many of her classic roles as suffering women, and she was complimented for her understatement, her quietness, and that the part fit her like a glove. But the truth is, quietness and understatement can often only bring you so far. And some reviewers actually stated that one soon gets tired of Joan's constant suffering and that, quote, the picture drags at times and it's Joan's fault. But even the reviews that applauded Joan's performance would all come to the same conclusion. That Joan might be good, but that Betty Davis was great and that she had the far more interesting role. As one article put it, both make it a tour de force with Miss Davis getting the most mileage out of a media part. From browsing through various contemporary reviews of Whatever Happened to Baby Jane, 
I came to the conclusion that there are about four different types of reviews. Some that, yes, feud is partly correct here, don't mention Joan at all, some that praise them equally, some that don't specifically say that Betty Davis is better, but somehow still bring that message across, and then the majority of reviews that do, in fact, give much more praise to Betty than they do to Joan. Critics would call it one of the greatest performances of Betty's career, or even one of the greatest ever seen on the screen. A tour de force that leaves the viewer emotionally exhausted and that it was impossible to take your eyes off her. Many reviewers openly described her as over the top and exaggerated as well, but didn't mind because it all happened in the context of her role and her movie. As one review said, it might be ham, but it's meaty and tasty. Betty Davis now suddenly also benefited from the fact that her work in the 50s had been much more disappointing than that of Joan Crawford, because Baby Jane felt like an exciting comeback for her in the tradition of All About Eve. A return to full form, while Joan did not really offer anything new here and was never considered to be away from the screen in the same way. And so Betty Davis easily became the face of whatever happened to Baby Jane. Also because Joan had miscalculated the appeal of both parts. As I had mentioned earlier, it's easy to assume that she thought Blanche would be the character that viewers related to, but Baby Jane became the natural standout and audience favorite. As Betty said, everybody has someone they'd like to feed a dead rat to. In the end, I think this sentence from one review sums up the reaction to the movie quite well. Betty is great in the wildest screen role of her career. John Crawford plays her sister. You know, speaking of Baby Jane, I think everybody agrees that uh, whatever happened to Baby Jane is probably your, probably your greatest triumph. Really wonderful. So I guess it's time now to talk about my own impression of Betty's performance. As I said in the beginning of this video, so a long time ago, this is a tricky one simply due to its iconic nature. The performance that brought Betty back into the Oscar race and back to the top of Hollywood even if only for a short amount of time, the performance people still talk about today, the performance that became part of pop culture history. How do you separate this reputation from the actual work? Well, I'll just try my best. The first thing I have to say right away, the iconic nature of Betty Davis' performance is very much earned. The movie might live from the interplay between her and Joan Crawford, but Betty's creation of Jane her way of walking, the childlike demeanor that can switch so easily from innocent to dangerous, her way of being both a victim and a culprit. This is one of the great performances in the thriller horror genre, quite simply because it never treats it as horror. Betty Davis instead said that for her, Baby Jane was, quote, a film about people. And this is always visible in her performance. You wouldn't be able to do these awful things to me if I weren't still in this chair. But you are Blanche, you are in that chair. While Betty enters the movie on a rather stereotypical note, as the clear antagonist to John Crawford's Blanche, she soon shows the amount of depths and layers hidden behind that grotesque appearance, revealing the pains of a forgotten child star with a lament about her present and no hope for the future, combining the usual expectations of the character and genre, the craziness, the violence, the unpredictability, with true character work with a haunted soul unable to find a place and direction. This way, she is also able to do what John Crawford most likely did not expect. Get the audience on Jane's side and make her motives and deeds understandable. Which is very crucial to balance the relationship between Jane and Blanche and make the later scenes of the movie emotionally work. It was like that time in the hotel room when they came and told me that you were hurting and that I'd done it. And there was a big man there. A a, a policeman and he hit me and he, he slapped me and, and I tried to tell him that I couldn't do a thing like that, not to my own sister. This is of course not intended as a review of John Crawford's work and I will not get into a performance in detail here. But what needs to be said is that she too is very integral to the success of whatever happened to Baby Jane. The movie needs the calmness of Blanche to balance the over the top nature of Jane. John Crawford slows the movie down when it needs to, while Betty Davis gives it speed and new dynamic. The chemistry between both actresses is obviously excellent, again from both sides, 
as they both bring to the table what they do best. But again, the nature of the role, the way Betty Davis interacts with her different co-stars, lets herself go, drives the plot forward and keeps the audience on the edge of their seats, always in complete control of every exaggerated body gesture, makes her the natural standout. Then you better give me that key and be quick about it! I won't and you can't make me! I'm not afraid of you! Her famous eyes have probably never been put to better use, as they can so easily portray the mental decline of Jane, but also the childlike wonderment, excitement when she thinks she is able to restart her career, and terror when the consequences of her actions are catching up with her. Yes, her performance is over the top, but the movie needs it. At least in most moments. There are some occasions when Betty Davis does feel a little bit too much overall, even in the context of Baby Jane, and while she again adds a lot of character to her scenes with Victor Bruno, some needed comedy, some intriguing hope for friendship or even love, she is always more interesting in her interactions with Blanche or in her moments of unhinged destructiveness. I got a friend down there, someone who's come to see me. He doesn't even know you exist. Still, while some moments might feel a bit too much, there are other scenes in her performance when Betty Davis reaches an almost Blanche Dubois-like level of pain and tragedy. When she suddenly elevates her material to a completely unexpected level of passes and intimacy. And due to the respect that Betty Davis has for her, Jane becomes so much more than the script ever intended her to be. They just didn't love you. Enough. You know that? They just didn't love you enough. I also appreciated Betty Davis was able to balance the different aspects of Jane. Yes, she can be clearly insane, out of control and lost in the world, but she works on her comeback with a visible clarity and determination, constantly switching between various extremes that add to the overall extremity of Jane as a character. It's a genuine baby Jane doll. I used to give them to all my really good friends, the, the people that I, I worked with. In the end, both Blanche and Jane are needed for whatever happened to baby Jane to be a success, but Betty Davis's work simply brings both the movie and her part to a higher level, by adding a human and tragic dimension to a stereotypical role, shifting the audience's focus to the classic antagonist and making Jane a both highly entertaining but also strangely frightening character. So yes, if you have only room for one of them at the Oscars, Betty is simply the go-to person. Sorry, Joan. What do you mean? All this time we could have been friends. And I guess this would now lead us to probably the most important chapter of whatever happened to Baby Jane. Because let's face it, every discussion seems only to be the foreplay for the best actress race and this one specific incident. Excepting for Anne Van Miss Joan Crawford. I mean, this is the moment it all comes down to. And if there ever was a true feud between Betty and Joan, it was born that night. There's a reason why Feud dedicates a whole episode to this one evening. And yes, there is a lot to say about the circumstances of Anne Bancroft's win, the question if Betty was really an undeniable frontrunner, and how the category was seen at the time, but this all takes place in the next part of this video series. So, what is there left to say? Not much, because, as I said, I only want to focus on whatever happened to Baby Jane here. My main goal simply was to make you aware that not everything you read or see about it is true, and that there is much more to the backstage story of this movie than legend would like us to believe. John Crawford only did a handful of movies after whatever happened to Baby Jane. She clearly saw the potential of the genre and stuck to it, but in movies of less and less quality in famously ending with Trog, the sad goodbye, to a remarkable career. Betty, on the other hand, kept herself busy, working on the big and the small screen, and she also became a regular talk show presence. Like Joan, she did various more horror or supernatural pictures, but would later hate to be associated with the genre so strongly. She also did countless TV pilots that were never picked up, and she also never gave up the idea of a third Oscar doing a supporting role in an Agatha Christie movie when another star from Hollywood's golden age had unexpected success with it, or appearing in a prestige drama in the 80s 
when it seemed like a good time for older actresses to triumph at the Oscars. Having been famous, successful, two Oscars, ten nominations altogether, there would be a tendency to rest on your laurels, wouldn't there? Why do you keep going? Oh, because I love, love, love making films. Yes, always will. Or the, or the roar of the crowd. And there's never really resting on your laurels. You must get better. However, this desired third Oscar win, as we know, never took place, and whatever happened to Baby Jane was ultimately the last true comeback of Betty Davis. But it's also important to remember that she never really went away. She won an Emmy for her TV work and kept acting even after suffering multiple strokes. You can of course ask the question why her career never again reached such a peak, especially in comparison to her co-nominee Catherine Hepburn, who would go on to win three more Oscars. But this is a story for another time. Am I not every bit her equal? Am I not every bit as interesting as she is? I guess in the career of Betty Davis, Baby Jane was a blessing and a curse. A sensational comeback and a truly iconic movie character, talked about to this day, but also a role that would typecast her. And the success of her movie did not teach Hollywood studios to give older actresses better material, but only that you could make some easy money by casting them in cheap B thrillers. In a way, you might say that Betty was maybe too successful with Baby Jane. And like Joan, unable to escape the typecasting she would establish with it and later Hush Hush Sweet Charlotte. And then, always driven by financial pressure, ultimately with little possibilities but to fulfill these stereotypes. When, when you do get a script, what kind of part are they interested in you for now? What are, oh, uh, quite often it's sort of a crazy type woman. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know. Well, you know. <laughs> Typecasting. Yeah, maybe so. <laughs> Very hard at this point to find a leading role that is suitable to me, mm -hmm. you know. And they just, they just don't write women. It's, it's tragic. Would a third Oscar have changed anything for Betty Davis? It's hard to say. It might have put her on the map again for better roles, but on the other hand, even with her three Oscar wins by the end of the 60s, it's not like Catherine Hepburn only made unforgettable classics as she got older. Great parts were rare, Oscar or not, and a win might have symbolized Betty's connection to the so-called exploitation genre even more. But of course for Betty, it was not only about the possible consequences of an Oscar win, but the honor itself. To be the first actress to win three. She was never shy to admit how much she wanted this, and knew forever exactly whom to blame when it didn't happen. But as I said, the discussion about the Oscar race is part of the next video.